Um, it's kind of fun to open this, uh, this third uh, segment because I can actually relate to a lot of the stuff that was done before me. Um, what I would like to convince you uh, from my talk is that while I'm addressing something that's called social television, I would like it to make sure that it's not social entertainment. Uh, with, I, I've been teaching a class for four years in uh, social television at MIT, and during those four years we had projects that, was, that were going all across the spectrum of what you can see on television, from news, new ways of gathering uh, information for the, the local newscast using crowdsourcing, uh, how to leave messages for your friends who live um, abroad so that when they do watch the content with you, that they will be able to see what you thought about it. Recreating water coolers and digital living rooms so that families that are dislocated can actually refine this value of, of watching content together. So another thing that I would like to leave you with is that there needs to be a better infrastructure to do this. A lot of the things we've talked about, it's very nice, it makes very nice demos, but when you start establishing this type of experiences from Istanbul to London to Boston to Los Angeles, it won't work or it, it, the quality will be really bad. So this brings me to uh, Marco Polo. And actually, Ferhan for a long time did not understand what my link to Marco Polo was. And um, let me just remind you that Marco Polo started this trek to China when he was 17, which is the age of our tweeting, Facebooking, and truly connected teenagers. And it took him three years to get there, during which he experienced a lot of things that us, designers also experienced. There were delays, there were problems of communication, there were stopping for days because things weren't going through. Um, he experienced new um, cultures, newer ways of thinking. He needed protocols, which is how we call it in the internet. We need protocols to go across. So for me, he was the perfect experience to show how the future of networking and the future of social television go together. And on top of it, it turns out that he was an incredible storyteller. So to follow Marco Polo is actually to follow the future of networking. And I would just like to acknowledge three people. Uh, Muriel, who is my, um, my boss actually at MIT and allows me to do all these incredible things. Uh, Henry Holtzman, who teaches the class of social TV with me at the Media Lab and Michael Louis, who is the artist who did all my view graphs because uh, my first version, as he, he had said, needed a lot of work. So, what is social television? And again, I'm not talking of social entertainment. I'm talking of social television. And the way we define it for our class, and the way we defined it, I think, all over the web, is to say that social television defines the services and the technologies that enable to socialize around TV content. And this is actually kind of interesting because in a way, if you think about it, the creating these experiences, until a few years ago, for a lot of people, television meant a device. And that device, most of the time, was some kind of living room. But more and more, if you think about it, when we talk about television, we see content. And the reason we see content is that television got out of the living room the same reason that our friend Marco Polo got out of Venice. The television started to discover new frontiers, and these frontiers were actually the internet, the cell phone, and the iPad. So the goal of what we do when we talk about social television and creating the networks to enable it are actually creating experiences around that content. And is this defining the future of television well, maybe yes and maybe no. What is the future of television? Well, we can all define it if we want, but we know that that future will go through the different devices and the different networks that we use. And again, as our friend Marco Polo in the when defined some kind of a future of the Silk Road, if not just a figment of his imagination, we can actually now define a number of new experiences that will define what this TV will, will be. So, it, this is the itinerary, and this morning, Dr. Uh, Norell presented it in a much better way with much more pictures, but this is actually where he went through. And 
For us, looking at an itinerary through the landscape of the current networking, what we need to recognize is that our devices do not end at their shells. There's going to be two speakers after me who are going to talk about all these sensors and all these, these cell phones that can now collaborate to give an incredible amount of extra information. Well, this is also part of your television experience. You get really, really excited. I come from Canada where people get really excited around hockey. Well, if there was a sensor to measure how people are excited around hockey, it would be a, probably capable to integrate this into the, the social viewing. Um, networks do not at the gateways. And actually, this is interesting because if I can find the little... Oh, that there were a lot of boundaries of different uh, kingdoms and... and realms of all kinds of things, and he actually went through. And a lot of times now, you will see that the networks and television experiences are still very much defined in silos. Well, you need to go beyond that. Uh, protocol should not enforce boundaries, and I'm going to come back on this. If you were going to go along that road, you needed a lot of letter patents, or actually things, the credentials that were telling that you were who you were. And somebody this morning talked about how do you trust people. Well, right now, a lot of times, these protocols that we use on the internet are there to enforce boundaries. They are not there to open us to go beyond. Well, if we want to create an integrated television experiences that actually brings together crowdsourcing, TV content, sensor information, and a few more Web 2.0, interactions, then these protocols cannot enforce the boundaries. They have to enforce an interface much more. And this is the last one, and this is something we started working on uh, quite recently, is this idea that up to now, networking and television, as an example, has been totally defined in the way that there was a physical connectivity, and that this physical connectivity would drive the way that we could communicate. Well, we started thinking, that's not the way it should be working. We should be able to define the connectivity within us with social connectivity and then create the network that we need to make it work and not the other way around. And when you start thinking about things like that, a lot of the things above start making a lot of sense because if we're going to define the best network for all of us to share a TV experience right now with somebody in Boston where it's about 10 a.m., Maybe there's some pieces of networks that should be changed for us to make this better. Um, TV was always about social interaction. I, I get really like phone calls from all kinds of entrepreneurs who tell me, oh, you know what, we're going to invent social television. Well, uh, social television was invented with the first TV program when somebody looked at their neighbor and said, did you watch this? Um, and the thing about this poor Marco Polo is I think for at least one year, they were waiting for the new pope to, uh, to be elected. And they needed these letters from the pope so that when they would go all the way to China, they would have this letter that would allow them to enter into a dialogue. But like a lot of social TV applications of today, he also recognized along his path that these letters were not enough. These letters were defining a relationship between him, the pope, and Kublai Khan. It was not defining how he would also deal with, with other traders or with tribes he was encountering. And so, in the TV experiences, sports news, drama, and reality, um, they all create different types of interactions. So the one-size-fits-all uh, is usually, and if you tried it, ends up being very uh, discomforting, and you don't really like it, and it's very disturbing. And you need to recognize this and embrace it if you're going to create the best experience. Actually, in our class, we tell always students that the content is king and that they have to design that experience and the network to support it around the content. Um, so we created a Twitter page for Marco, for Marco Polo. It was shut down after 20 minutes. Um, but we figured out that he, being 17 years old and living through this incredible journey, he would have probably tweeted about it. And so, <clears throat> this is also to say that he would have tweeted about it, but who would have been his followers? And right now, there is this um, big, well, he would have had probably a lot of followers, but I mean, there's this big 
Um, I would say trend right now in thinking that if you have a television and a tweet feed, you're done. Well, you're done in some way, but it's also well known that people, although you are ready to read tweets all the time about things that people talk about and you may not know these people, because there is something in television which is very intimate, it's your experience. A lot of people are not interested by the tweets of people they don't know. And so there's this idea of recreating an affinity group. And this morning there was somebody who was asking me, how do you create these affinity groups? Well, actually, a tweet group could be good. A Facebook group could be good. But it has to be, the filtering has to be a, li a little bit beyond just a hashtag. Because the hashtag, although it's good for a conference like this one, which has a large audience, maybe for the content that you like on television, it is way too wide. So there's a lot of, and I'm going to come back on it, but there's a lot of work being done now on, on collaborative filtering and how to define exactly just the content that you need for your experience. Um, I'm going to be short on this one because the only thing that is important is that our friend Marco Polo was going to pack for a long time, so he left a lot of things behind. And I think that we're leaving more and more our big television behind because our new experience is more on cell phone and iPads. So right now, if you're going to design these things, if I put my designer head, uh, you're going to look much more into an ecosystem than just a device. And actually, the storytelling is evolving in this mobile, social, and connected world. Like There is more and more programming that is being designed with the idea that people are going to socialize around it. And I think uh, with the Olympics this summer, there's going to be an incredible amount of applications which will allow people to collaborate while they watch the show. Um, we talked about watching TV on, on the web and on your phone. And, and actually, this growth of wireless video um, creates major disruption. And uh, Cisco last year created waves when they said that the rise of wireless video will be 60 times uh, in the next few years. So that actually went everybody scrambling. And the question is, do you need to re redo the whole infrastructure? Or is that innovation that's needed to survive it much more looking at things you have in a new way? And that's what we started thinking. And the comment here about the, uh, the emissaries is that Marco Polo in his story uh, was amazed at the speed over which messaging could go through the, the, whole, the whole Kublai Khan empire, and also how these people could move very fast. And actually, they had invented caching. They had all these caravanserai that Mark talked about, where you could get better horse, new horses, you could go very fast, you could get a new messenger to do that. And actually, by doing that in our networks, we can actually make things better. We can cache the information when it's needed, and when we're going to get it, we're going to be able to get it there, not to have across, to go across the network to get the messaging. So, at the same time that this is really cool that everything's going wireless, you should know that the the networks that you use right now are often not very much designed for it. And it gets better. I talked about collaborative filtering. And again, if you read the Marco Polo story, there's a lot of things that he doesn't talk about because he didn't, didn't go there. A lot of people think that he actually never went to where he, go he, go he went. But actually, a lot of his story is about he went there because it had been recommended by someone else. And this is what we do in our content of video content all the time. Most of the viewers on YouTube go there because they've been recommended by someone. Someone they know, or actually it's the viral of the week. And it, it, it's actually for all kinds of content now. The, the biggest viral uh, YouTube video was about two weeks ago, was this a video about this uh, war criminal in Africa. And although it was half an hour long, it was seen, I don't know by how many million of people, and it's probably still growing. So right now, you need better ways, though, of recommending this thing. How do you know that this person that you know is going to like the same thing you do? A lot of collaborative filtering now is done. If Mark watched this and Mark and I like dinosaurs, probably we will both like this other show. Well, it's not the way it works, because maybe we don't like the same thing at all. Uh, people started thinking it would be family-oriented. Well, I have family members who love science fiction, and I would never watch one of their shows. So how is collaborative filtering happening? And I'm sure when we're going to hear about cell phones, there's a lot of things about augmented reality. There's a lot of things about mobility. There's a lot of things about location-based that can help into deciding what type of content that you like. 
Uh, we also created a Facebook group for Marco Polo. And you will see here that he currently resides in Xanadu. He was born in Venice on January 1st, which is all true. This was also shut down. Um, but um, the interesting, the reason we wanted to have it is because Facebook allows you to do groups. And this is, strangely enough, how our research started. Our research started about five years ago when Facebook got there. And we said, what can we do with it? And at the same time, we were doing a lot of research on convergence, convergence of cell phones, PCs, and television. And we said, well, there's something about Facebook that is kind of cool. What are they going to do with it? Their uh, chief of s television made a declaration last week at the NBC Universal Social Television Summit or something, where that they felt that they were the, um, the perfect water cooler. And I hope they, get a, they, they actually do more with it. There's currently very little things you can click in Facebook to watch. And actually, this is a problem because it gets to all these relationship of business. But this actually, yes, the, uh, the start of it. And um, we, we, we would have hoped that the page would have stayed long enough for you guys to be able to subscribe to it today. But um, they didn't like it. Um, I'm going to finish with two or three things. Um, the other one that is, is interesting is for a long time, again, Marco Polo was stuck in the desert because he couldn't go anywhere. And this is what I was talking about, this idea of user experience. People were mentioning the availability or the non-availability of broadband. Um, if you're stuck in the desert, to be able to copy something on a USB stick and give it to the next caravan, who's going to take five days before they can plug it to the next computer, is perfect because you don't have another choice. And so this idea of the user experience is key to the deployment of all these social uh, media experiences. But at the same time, it's very subjective, so it's very hard to define. And as of now, there's a lot of people who are actually trying to do that. Finally, in a way, um, what's about privacy? As we talked a lot about social today, but we didn't talk about what is this idea of our privacy inside a social world. And DRM, which is a bad word for many people, has actually been developed to protect a business model. It's, it's not really protecting content. It's protecting the business of that company with another content, a content provider. What we started to, uh, to do is actually look, looking at the way to protect social commentary. So I can actually send, have commenting with Farhan without having any of you guys see it, although we're all sharing peer-to-peer -peer the same amount of video. So we've just started this, and the idea that we can do that, it's because uh, the power, the CPU inside cell phones right now, and portables in general is so high that we can do mathematical, um, I don't know, mathematical expressions that before would have been completely impossible. And I'm running out of time, but I'm getting to the end. Um, so why did I want to sprinkle all of these ideas? Well, actually, for the same reason that our friend Marco Polo at the end created the travelogue. He brought it all together. And in all the work that's been done by our students, um, this is what actually what they do. They bring it all together. They take the network. They take the privacy. They take the mobility. They take the ecosystem. And then they take their own creativity, and they create this travelogue of their own experience with social media. <coughs> and I was saying at the beginning that uh, I don't know if that's the future of television, but for sure, um, as probably Marco Polo created a, a view of the 13th century through his own travelogue, well, probably we will see a vision of our, at least our early 21st century through these social television experiences. So looking at the future, there was somebody this morning who asked, um, what is it going to be in the 2,000 years? I think it's very hard to say what it's going to be in five years. Who remembers the world before Facebook? And actually, the speed of that, um, of these new things that are taking over, it took hundreds of years before, between the invention of the printing press to the invention of the telephone. And the, 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 the things that are changing our lives are happening so fast. I don't know what's going to happen very soon. But again, when we create these social TV experiences, we want to make sure that we do not exclude people, but that we include people. So we want to look at feature phones, and we want to look at standard television, not just the connected ones. And so what is the, um, going to be the um, future of that digital Silk Road? Um, 
probably it's going to be more flat. There's going to be more internet traffic through it. Maybe some of the problems we have right now at designing experiences are going to be uh, changed and are going to be improved. And, but it for sure is going to be mobile and it's going to be social. And in a way, we are mobile. I am here today. I am mobile, not just my phone. I'm social because I'm talking to you and you will talk back to me. So in a way, that future of the Silk Road being mobile and social is actually all of us. Thank you very much. <laughs>